drive through the cornfield over a small hill and turn right at the edge of the cemetery. These were the directions my new white boyfriend gave me the first time I was to drive to his parents' house. It was late, it was dark, it was winter 2006, the first time I drove through the cornfields in the rural Midwestern US state of Indiana over a small hill that sloped gently at the bottom and turned right at the edge of a quaint cemetery to meet my future, alhamdulillah, former family. I'm gonna keep it real for the next 12 minutes. <laughs> my sisters had demanded to know just where these white folks live, having only met the boyfriend and not the parents or the siblings. When I told them the name of the small town and repeated his rough directions, one of my sister's eyes bugged wide. The other slammed shut inside her shaking head. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> They're gonna kill you up there, she said matter-of-factly. Now, neither one of them had reason to believe I would actually die that night or any other night in the small town, save the images of good, innocent black people who had driven through similarly ominous cornfields with good white people and never come out. Our histories reflect how difficult it can be, how dangerous it can be for people living in black bodies to cross in and out of spaces that are touted so safe and so welcoming, safe and welcoming for people living in white bodies. Now this image is taken during my mother's lifetime. She's alive and well. I'll spare you the images taken from my own lifetime. As an American, I feel comfortable saying that there's more than one America, forged on by interlocking systems of oppression, which both divide, which both structure and perpetuate racism. In America and in other places, we are sometimes want to call these systems something other than what it is. It feels easier to call it class or caste, religion or dogma, much easier than skin color. But those of us who were oppressed by race understand from very early ages the fear of being mistaken, misunderstood, abused, harassed, killed, simply for living in a black body. This fear is intuition, not delusion. It's healthy paranoia, if not a full-on spidey sense. You know when something seemingly innocent, otherwise dismissible, has its roots in active disdain or hate. As black people, we are sometimes saddened when we see our children take on this dark reality, shed their naivete. It robs them of a carefree childhood that every kid should be entitled to. As a black mother, I can attest that sometimes we are simultaneously relieved when we see our children take on this fear and intuition. The idea is that it might keep them safe from the history of violence which grows up from America's deep and deeply racist roots. It doesn't feel fair. It doesn't feel safe. It does feel safer. Unfortunately, black people are often not believed when we describe the everyday racism or the residual impacts of everyday racism on our lives. A part of this can be other people just don't feel it. It can be hard to confirm what you don't feel. Others believe that this racism only exists in our history. Recently, this racism, race-related violence has shown up as fodder for really improbable horror films, much to my surprise and delight, I'm not sure yet. I watched one of these films, Jordan Peele's Get Out, with a room of wildly diverse other audience members. I remember thinking, how do our lived experiences, that which guides our intuition, the lenses through which we view our parallel yet distinctly disparate histories and realities, how do they position us to see this movie? What do people think is actually horrible about it? For me, the slow descent into horror begins in the early opening scenes. So I, by the way, I won't ruin it for anybody. If, you've, if you're late to see this movie, like it's not my fault, but I won't ruin it for anybody. You're mad late. Uh, but just to bring us all in the same room, by way of background, there's a main character, Chris, who's a black man dating a white woman named Rose. Chris is preparing to drive up through the forest to meet Rose's family for the first time. Seemed eerily familiar. 
I watch Chris as he packs his bag for the weekend, playful banter with Rose, and he says, you know, I don't want to get chased off the lawn with a shotgun. Rose has an opportunity now, as Chris has invoked this fear, invoked the scenes and the images of people who've been shot at, chased, or worse, for looking at white women. And instead, instead of taking this opportunity to inquire about the depth of his concern, the verity of his paranoia, the extent of his fear, Rose simply responds, mom and dad would have voted for Obama if they could have. Spare me, right? So as a person who experiences race living in a black body, and as a person who's done rigorous research on the functionings of race, I recognize this as a clear non sequitur. Her response simply has nothing to add to what he has offered her. They're not connected in any way. That her parents love Obama, whether that's true or not, that they would have voted for him for a third term, whether that's true or not, has nothing to do with the fear that he has introduced in their relationship. Nothing at all. But it is a demonstration of how someone hears your fear, presumably, and instead of acknowledging it, shifts the focus from you and your fear and your fear of pain to something laughable, dismissible, invisible. Perhaps the suggestion that you should laugh, that someone laughs at your fear suggests that you should laugh at yourself too. It's at least a reminder that no one sees, no one affirms, no one cares about your fear. Even this person who, who posits to like you, to respect you, to love you. No one cares but you. I remember a colleague during this movie sort of saw me rolling my eyes at Rose, this fictional white woman who didn't, couldn't, wouldn't attend to the feelings of her partner. And she asked me, what should, what, what should she have done? What should she have done in this instance? Right? This is sort of tip of the iceberg moment. And it was. This was the first time that Chris had offered how he felt, what he feared, a sort of tip of the iceberg. We're all familiar with this term, right? The tip of the iceberg. The suggestion is that no matter how massive, how humongous an iceberg is when you see it, you're really only seeing 20% of it. There's a whole 80 odd percent of it underneath the surface of the waterline. The intricacies really important to what you're actually able to see. And unfortunately, as you get deeper and deeper and deeper in this iceberg, it becomes more and more difficult to see even the hand in front of your face. And so those of us who study human behavior and study the ways that we interact with each other have adopted this feel of the iceberg and laid on top of it a framework that can help us understand just what is happening when we're talking to one another, when we understand one another, when we misunderstand one another. And so just so we're talking about the same thing, I want to review this framework with you a little bit and contextualize it with this movie that some of us have seen and some of us are late to see. So at the top you have these events these are presumably discrete moments in time that can be described objectively. Chris saying to Rose, he doesn't want to get chased off the lawn with a shotgun, something that most people who've seen the movie would remember and could describe. After that, you have patterns of events. Chris invoking the sort of spirit or us knowing the, the histories of people who have been harassed in similar ways for similar things or less. So there's a pattern of these events happening. Then on the structural level, it's those practices and policies that we put in place to ensure that we can have a repetition of these patterns of events over time. At the structural level here, many of us will know, and others of us may be somewhat familiar, is an imbalance from its origins, deeply flawed US legal system, which punishes some and privileges others based on race, certainly not on inalienable rights. The ways that this system protects some and punishes others ensures a pattern of things happening in a particular way. So the herein you have this event. Now, if at the structural level, this is the how does this work, then at the mental model level, it's what is the general perspective at play? What do we really think that makes us create these patterns of events over time? In this case, the general consensus, the general perspective here is that it is still permissible for people to be discriminated against or treated differently. And that leads us to the unconscious container. 
you can't necessarily see it here, but the idea is at the bottom of this iceberg, it is so dark. It is so difficult to see the distance between your perspective and someone else's. It's also because it comes to a tip. It's likely that your perspective is so much further from the tip of the next iceberg, the bottom of the next iceberg. And so Chris's statement here is not just playful banter, just making fun of what the weekend might be like. The sentence itself, I don't want to get chased off the lawn with a shotgun, is a summation and reflection of America's storied histories around race relations laid over the depths of this iceberg. Think about a time when someone shared with you a fear of theirs, something that they held very deeply, that they needed confirmation about, they needed affirmation, they needed your support. Did you respond with disbelief, with challenge, with rebuff? Was your response when you think about how they'd identified the heart of their problem somewhere deep, deep, deep down on this iceberg where you can't really see it anymore? It's not that deep. Have we heard people say this? Have we said this? It's not that deep. This is essentially what people experience day in and day out, looking for a place to get confirmation on what they're experiencing, even if other people can't feel it. And this is a common refrain. It's not that deep. Are we comfortable with this? Are we okay to be a rose when a Chris shows up? Are we okay to not confirm people's fears when they demonstrate the ultimate vulnerability and bring them to us? This is a question. This is a question that all of us can take with us as we go. What would it cost? What would it cost to confirm someone's fear, even if you don't feel it yourself? What would it cost to inquire deeply? What would it cost us in these moments? My last words to you tonight come from the incomparable 20th century American author, James Baldwin, who is my absolute uncontested favorite. Likely top 20 people in the whole wide world. He's not here with us anymore. Still a favorite. I offer this to you and I ask that you will read it with me. You can have the proverbial last word tonight and in the future. There's something about seeing more clearly, naming, acknowledging, that's integral to changing. We have to see things that we can't see. We have to put ourselves in a position to hear things from others, confirm them, be with them as allies and accomplices. And so I ask you to join me in reading this tonight, and this will be our last word. Not everything But nothing, not everything that can be faced can be changed. But nothing can be changed that is not faced. Thank you.